Guys, all of you here today, you've heard of Netflix, right? And I bet that almost all, if not all of you, know what Facebook is and probably have an account. So let's go back to that moment when you're just thinking about something and then you see it five seconds later as an advert for you. It's kind of spooky, right? Sort of weird, but also sometimes kind of helpful. Personalized marketing has never been as effective as it is right now because with every interaction, we share so much information on our unique preferences, on what makes us tick. We're no longer just one of the masses, we're a real individual. So when things are suggested for you to buy, they really are for you. The suggestions come from analytics, generated by data collected from all the previous times that you've liked, bought, or even just scrolled past something. And we see the same in social media ads, the same with suggestions you get on Amazon or on Google. But my question to you and to our wider community is, where is this in our education? Where is the carefully curated algorithm that's going to tell you exactly what you're missing, what you need, what you should study to improve overall so you can reach your potential? Well, apparently nowhere. When we consider education, we have to remember it is our future and a couple of exams will determine which university you go to, what subject you can study, and those factors will really, really intricately entangle with opportunities that you have access to. And those opportunities can lead to massive changes that will impact your whole adult life. For example, think about meeting or not meeting the person you're supposed to live your life with, or your best friend, or the inspiration that you do or don't find. Education is important. It's a way to reach social mobility and it's a way to empower ourselves as individuals and as a society. An educational charity in the UK states that 10 to 20% of a student's academic outcome is actually down to the school that they attended. And since the potential of exams is lifelong, it's a pretty large gap that we leave to chance. And when we consider education, we have to consider all of the education that a student receives. Because even starting from primary school, kids from disadvantaged backgrounds are less likely to be in the top 10% for attainment in English and math. And as they progress in their school life, they continue to be less likely to succeed academically. So you could say, as the years grow, so does the gap of disadvantage. And this gap is not overtly obvious in its importance. But if we consider something like trying to get a place at university, it becomes more clear why this gap in achievement is a problem. For example, Oxbridge. From the top eight schools, the number of acceptances was as many as across another 2,894 schools and colleges put together. And obviously it's not going to be as easy for someone from a low socioeconomic background to achieve the same grades as someone with the financial capacity to support tutoring summer schools, extracurricular experiences to enrich their application. And of course, this does get taken into account, but perhaps at the point of applying, it's too late. Taking a very specific example of tutoring, parents from lower socioeconomic backgrounds employed tutors only 6% versus 30% when we look at parents from higher socioeconomic backgrounds. And when we look at tutoring, we also must remember it's very expensive with average costs per hour for many subjects being 40 pounds or above. When you look at the price tag, you realize how ineffective it is in helping students. I started thinking about the lack of technology that we don't use to help us in the context of education and more specifically in tutoring. And I started to question the basic norms that I grew accustomed to. For example, why was no one really able to tell me how exactly I should work towards my goals in my time frame? Why would you to say something so generic as this is how I do my lesson, we'll do it like this. And look, I can be this harsh because I'm not only a student, but I am a tutor and no parent has ever asked me to diagnose their child. I'll share a conclusion that I came to shortly, but before that, I really want to address a question that's probably on your minds right now. Why? Why do we need to know how to help someone figure out their points of weakness in their knowledge? Well, look, as we saw, our society looks to education, to grades, to various parameters within academic settings to define our success. 
A strange conclusion, or let's say observation that I came to was as a student, when I asked for help, the approach was to resolve the problem that was happening in that moment. And if we're taking an analogy from the healthcare setting, dealing with the problem that someone tells you about in that moment is actually dealing with the superficial symptoms, perhaps without actually solving the underlying condition. And doctors like educators do try most of the time to actually look for the simplest solution if there are no indicators which prompt us to think about a deeper problem. Because that's what we're trained to do. You know the saying, if you hear hoofbeats, don't look for zebras? Well, the same rings true. But most doctors, if there is a persistent issue, will dig deeper to try and find the root cause of the problem. So my question to you again is, where is this in our education system? Why is it that if someone comes to a help class over and over and over and over again, struggling with the subject, our education system does not provide us with tools to assess our patients further, but the actual current practice is to dismiss a student for being uninterested, unintelligent, or just to assume that they lack some fundamental ability to understand the subject. Why do we not consider that they've actually missed something minor, but fundamental, a concept which was introduced earlier in their academic career? What if the educators are actually missing the patient's history? And perhaps worst of all, what if the patient is not being listened to? I had students come to me and say, I'm bad at maths, I don't get maths, maths doesn't get me. And many of them have been told this for years. That was sickening to me and very disheartening because what I saw were kids age 11 or 13, sometimes younger, sometimes older, but all of them had their confidence kicked out of them by a system which sadly doesn't have the capacity to bring the level of attention that we need as learners and as individuals just require. But telling kids they're not good enough is not good enough. And quite frankly, it's just not true. What those kids were missing were some basic building blocks in their understanding. And what those teachers were missing were the tools to support their students. The missing building blocks might have been few and let's say pretty easy to fix, but they were fundamental. And without concepts which underlie a subject, you're not going to be able to develop an understanding for more complex problems. It's a principle which is intrinsically intuitive to us. We use it in arts, in music and sports, but the fundamental flaw in our system is this. And it has a relatively simple fix provide personalized, affordable, and ongoing support to students. And now you probably will say that there are parents and tutors and teachers and so on, but it's not enough. A new era of education is needed. We need to break through into a reality where you can make use of your genome in the context of education. And perhaps through data and technologies, find a supporting tool for that. Data is a gold mine, but look, raw data is not actually that useful to us because what we're looking for are specific patterns to help specific individuals. And our own methods of taking in and processing information differs. And so with the differences, with the patterns, which are unique, comes a very intrinsically unique benefit to each one of us. And process data can show us actually where we need to carry out our targeted learning how we can fix our problematic areas and reach our potential. A term which often accompanies data is artificial intelligence. AI is a wide variety of technologies from machine learning to natural language processing. These technologies allow machines to sense, to comprehend, act and learn. AI is not a new concept, but in the recent decades, it's become more accessible. And so its implementation is also increased. From the finance world to the healthcare, to arts, to education, to artificial intelligence technologies everywhere. They're not here to take over the world. They're here to do the tasks that we don't have to do, such as processing data. And whatever your stance on artificial intelligence, I'm sure you'll agree that having a machine comb through thousands of points of data is easier and much more efficient than us trying to do it ourselves. So when we look 
at AI in the context of education, it's the same idea. AI technologies are not here to replace teachers. They're not here to replace the students or the real interactions. They're here to enhance them. And I'll give you one technology as an example, natural language processing. NLP is something that a few months ago I felt I was so unfamiliar with, and I've never interacted with it at all. But that was wrong. You know Siri? Well, if you've ever used Siri, you've interacted with NLP. Natural language processing shouldn't just be used to tell us if we should take an umbrella outside. The possibilities in education are pretty phenomenal. Being a medical student, I often found that I wasn't managing to take in the large volumes of information I was supposed to. Effectively, because I just felt that I didn't have a way to do so. My chosen method is active recall and it takes a lot of time. And my options were quite limited to studying by myself, which was very boring, studying with a partner, which was, let's say, at max 50% effective, or to hire a tutor, which was crazy expensive. So I knew there was another way, or at least I felt that there should be. And at that point, I started thinking, what if we use natural language processing to create an AI tutor who reads and questions you on content that you upload and promotes active recall by interacting with you and providing you an unbiased assessment of what you actually learned during that hour or two hours or 10 hours so you can go back and patch up the gaps that you perhaps didn't take in. I found an NLP company that focuses on providing language learning and it's exciting because language learning does use a lot of the repetition, a lot of the interacting with sounds that you see natural language processing technologies doing. And I'm excited to see it in the sector of education, but I'm worried that we're going slower than other sectors and that's a problem. And look, I get it. Education is an institution and institutions don't like change, but we have to evolve so we can get closer to that reality of providing equity of opportunity for all. I feel it's really important for us to reflect on how each one of us can play a role in this change. Because for example, my personal experience with tutoring and technology and interest in data led me to question the not so innovative system of tutoring and start to develop some solutions such as the AI tutor and a platform which will support students by mapping out their path to success. AI is not perfect. And data holds as much bias as we do, of course. Ethics of data handling, ethics of data storage, and the use of data for the good of us and our future is something we can work towards, not simply by hoping, but through educating, through policy making, through advocacy, through finding leaders from different walks of life to bring a new view, a new idea to solving age old problems. Artificial intelligence should not replace interactions, and it will not. But what we are moving into is an era of luxury where we can delegate tasks to machines which would have taken up our time in the past. And this gap, which is created by delegating tasks to machines, will give us an opportunity to interact with each other more, to learn and to evolve. And I might seem like an optimistic 22 year old who hasn't really got enough experience about how the world works yet, but I will cling to this optimism for the rest of my life because I want to fight injustice. Injustice of geography, determining your life's outcome. Injustice of financial hardship, which you didn't choose and should not be defined by. In using artificial intelligence, what we can do is we can bring about truly targeted learning improve the efficacy of studying and make access to high quality education accessible for all. And through this, we can achieve personal academic success and with success come options for university courses, for careers, for the right environment to really inspire you to be part of the solution and to make a united society which is empowered for all. I believe that geographical borders don't define our ambitions. I believe that your socioeconomic background doesn't determine your potential and desire to succeed. I do believe, however, we need to look at systemic injustices which are engraved in our history and are still echoing into our now. We must stand united when we're most divided and in these times of division, we must look for ways in which we can connect to one another again. 
I truly believe that education is the foundation to solutions of many root causes of problems we see today. And I believe that through combining human compassion and intellect with efficiency of machines, we can bring equity to all and build a truly inclusive future. Thank you for your attention.